Hey there, what's going on everybody? Thanks for joining us on Cinema Recap. Today, we'll be talking about that 1999 American sci-fi film called Bicentennial Man. Spoilers ahead. Our movie starts with the delivery of a large metal box to a family home. As that delivery truck driver hauls that box inside, a man named Richard Martin calls his family downstairs into the living room. The delivery man opens the box, revealing a life-sized metal robot. And there's a small remote in the box. And when he presses a switch on it, the robot comes to life. Now Amanda, the youngest of the two daughters, is frightened. She wants to know what it is. And her older sister tells her that it's an android. Amanda mispronounces android as Andrew, and thus, the family decides to rename the robot from his official title of NDR-114 to Andrew. Now the first thing Andrew does is present the three laws of robotics, turning his head into a projector as he explains the rules that all robots must follow. The first is to never harm a human being. The second is to always follow orders, unless it directly interferes with the first rule. And the third is that robots must protect themselves, unless the protection violates the first two laws. Later on, Richard fixes a place for Andrew down in their basement, where Andrew connects to a power outlet and spends the night charging. On the next day, the kids head off to school, while Richard goes to work, leaving Andrew alone with Mom. Despite their lavish lifestyle, high-tech purchases, and huge house, Andrew's wife doesn't have to work, reminding you that this movie was made in the 90s. She's uncomfortable with his presence, and thus makes him spend the day cleaning out the basement to keep him as far away from her as possible. That night, Andrew cooks an excellent dinner for the family, but is relegated to the kitchen as they eat. Afterwards, he watches the parents play chess. When Grace calls for him to come help her, she asks him to jump out the window, and he does so without question, landing hard in the garden. But Richard realizes what Grace did when Andrew rings on that doorbell asking to come inside. He looks a little damaged, as expected from falling out a window, but is otherwise unharmed. Richard calls his daughters downstairs for a family discussion, explaining that although Andrew is not technically a person, they must treat him like one, which means no more trying to break him. The kids are sent off to bed while Andrew goes down to the basement for self-repair. On the next day, Andrew watches the girls as they play on the beach. Amanda offers Andrew a miniature glass horse, but he has no concept of its fragility and ends up breaking it. She's all distraught and orders him to leave her alone while she cries. And as Andrew turns away, he sees a piece of driftwood on the floor, and it seems to give him an idea. That evening, Andrew's reading wood carving books in the basement while working with the piece of driftwood he found on the beach. He ends up carving a miniature horse. That looks like the piece he broke and leaves it on her bed for her to find. The wooden horse delights her, and as a thanks, she gives Andrew a stuffed dog named Woofy. So the next morning during breakfast, Richard contemplates the wooden horse that Andrew has carved. He can't believe that Andrew carved it himself and assumes that he's lying. Well, Andrew plainly states that he can't even tell a lie unless ordered to. All he did was study wood carving until he could make a shape that he knew would appeal to Amanda. That night, Richard hears classical music playing from the basement and follows the noise to Andrew, who's listening on an old gramophone, bringing us to the next day where Richard takes him back to the robotics company that made him. And there he meets Dennis Mansky, who asks Richard what his complaint seems to be. Richard explains that Andrew is displaying things that an android shouldn't, like curiosity and creativity, and shows Dennis the wooden animal carvings. Dennis doesn't think much of it and chalks it up to some fault in the android's neural pathways, a mechanical failure that needs to be fixed or replaced. This angers Richard, who sees Andrew's eccentricities as important and unique, not as a mistake that needs to be fixed. He leaves, taking Andrew with him, and on the way home, explains the new schedule that he's going to set for the android. First off, Andrew is to spend part of the day doing something creative. And second, he'll have to spend some of the evening with Richard, learning things that his wiring hasn't taught him. Thus, Andrew's spending part of his day carving wooden sculptures and part of his night with Richard, who begins by teaching him about the miracle of life. They have an awkward conversation about reproduction. So a few days into this new schedule, Andrew's noticing Richard laughing. And later, that evening, during their nightly classes, Richard tries to explain the concept of humor. This results in Andrew reciting a string of inappropriate jokes on the breakfast table. Later on, Amanda's teaching Andrew how to play a duet on the piano. We see the years pass as they play, and she's suddenly all grown up, no longer a child but a young woman. 
Grace, now an adult too, has bleached her hair and is cavorting with a boy on his motorcycle, much to the exasperation of her mother. She gets home and asks her husband what they're going to do about Grace, but he just hopes that it's a phase she'll grow out of. Now, there are dozens of wooden grandfather clocks in the house, and every hour the collective ringing is deafening. Richard's wife is sick of these clocks, and so Richard proposes that they sell them and keep the money. Amanda's upset, arguing that Andrew made the clocks and so the money should go to him, to which Richard seems to agree. Now, sometime later, Richard introduces Andrew to the family lawyer, Bill Feingold. As they sit down to discuss business, we find out that Richard is here because Andrew has made quite a lot of money selling clocks and wants to open his own bank account. However, there's no legal precedent. Now, afterwards, Andrew's in the basement, which has been turned into a woodworking shop when Amanda rushes in. The sudden interruption makes Andrew cut his thumb off, but he assures her that it can be repaired. As he continues his work, Amanda is explaining that her boyfriend Frank has asked her to marry him. And while he's the perfect guy, she's unsure about it. We figure out that Amanda is actually in love with Andrew, but can't have a relationship with him because, well, you know, she's a person and he's a household appliance. Andrew, however, is unaware of her feelings, and by the end of their conversation, she asks him to be an usher at her wedding, and he accepts, excited by the prospect of wearing a tuxedo for the first time. Now, to repair his thumb, Richard has to bring him back to Dennis at the robotics company. He installs an alarm on Andrew, warning Dennis that if he tries to enter Andrew's brain or mess with his coding in any way, an alarm would go off, alerting the police and potentially getting the company sued. As the meeting comes to a conclusion, Andrew asks if, during the repairs, he can have his face altered to be more expressive so his thoughts and feelings can show better. Dennis explains that such a procedure would be extremely expensive. But when he types out the number, Andrew calmly replies that his monthly income from making clocks can easily cover that cost. More time passes by and Amanda gets married, with Andrew acting as an usher in the ceremony. As they're walking down the aisle hand in hand, we see that Andrew's face has been altered just like he asked. After the wedding reception, Richard's sitting alone and Andrew joins him. Using the projector in Andrew's head, they watch the ceremony over again and the sight makes Richard emotional. Andrew takes the opportunity to ask if he can continue wearing clothes and Richard doesn't see why not. Now, 12 years pass by. Amanda's obviously older and has a child of her own now, but Andrew, of course, looks exactly the same, although he's not wandering around naked anymore. They're lounging out on the beach when Andrew asks her how to obtain his freedom. Amanda doesn't understand, insisting that he doesn't really need it because the family doesn't boss him around anymore, but Andrew wants it anyway. He studied history ever since and believes that if so many wars have been fought and lives lost for the ideal of freedom, then it must be worth having. So that night, a now elderly Richard is reading by the fire when Andrew gives him a slip of paper. It's a check with all the money in his bank account and he's offering it to Richard in exchange for his freedom. He explains that everything will be the same, with Andrew staying with the family and serving him, but formally, he would no longer be considered Richard's property. Amanda walks in, and Richard blames this sudden request on her, but she's arguing that it was bound to happen, as Andrew only becomes more complex and human with time. So the next day, Richard returns the check to Andrew. He tells him that he's free now, but he must leave the house. Andrew explains that he doesn't wish to leave, but Richard tells him that it's a consequence of freedom. Well, Andrew goes but stays in the area, so that he's at least available if Richard ever needs him. He takes up a residence on the beach, designing and eventually building a wooden house to live in. 16 years go by now. Amanda's walking along the shoreline and into Andrew's house to find him working. She tells him that Richard's asking for him, and they head back to the house to find Richard on his deathbed. Richard tells him that he was right to ask for his freedom, and is glad he had it. After Richard's death, Andrew wants to find more of his kind, but his parent company won't answer any of his requests. He seeks out the services of Lloyd, Amanda's son, who has recently passed the bar exam and asked to sue them for the whereabouts of all the other NDR series robots like Andrew. Lloyd has no interest in helping, as he doesn't share his mother's attachment to Andrew, but he agrees because seeking out the other NDR androids would keep Andrew busy for a long time. Now, during their meeting, we also find out that Amanda has divorced her husband. It appears that Lloyd wins the case. As in the next scene, Andrew is traveling around the world, searching for surviving NDR androids. 20 years have passed and he hasn't found any of them that are still functioning. 
He's nearing the end of his journey with little hope, until he hears of an NDR robot in San Francisco that's been rebuilt. And so he sets off to find it. The surviving android seems to be a female version of him, and he follows her from a fruit stall to a building that reads Rupert Burns Enterprises. He knocks on the door and tells the robot that he's here to see Rupert Burns, and so she lets him in. Inside, we find out that her name is Galatea, but she doesn't appear to have Andrew's ability to learn and question things. A man appears. It's Rupert Burns. We find out that his father was originally an engineer at Andrew's parent company, Northam Robotics, until he was fired. Rupert shows him his experiments, which are designed to give old androids human features. Andrew's fascinated by the technology and offers to fund his research so that he can receive entirely human features. They choose the age to design the body, and the experiment proceeds. It's an entirely external physical upgrade, meaning that Andrew's mechanical brain and metal skeleton remains the same, but skin and appendages are added on top, until he looks completely human. When the procedure's over, Andrew's first thought is to go see Amanda. She's inside, playing the piano, when he walks in without knocking. He explains that he's Andrew, but has an upgrade. She, however, has no idea who he is. An older woman walks in, and we realize that the woman on the piano wasn't Amanda, but her granddaughter, Portia, who happened to look exactly like her. Now, one rainy night, Andrew finds a dog on his porch and names it Woofy. Later on, he goes to visit Portia. She lets him and his dog into the house while he explains that he wants a friend to talk to. But with Richard dead and Amanda old, Portia is all he knows. Hearing this softens her heart, and so she invites him to sit on the couch and speak to her. Now in the next scene, we find ourselves in a futuristic hospital, with Portia telling Andrew that Amanda had a stroke. Andrew walks into her room, noticing that she still carries the little wooden horse he's made for her. They say their goodbyes and Amanda dies peacefully. Tears are rolling down Portia's face. Andrew can't help but comment how cruel it is that he cannot express his pain and cry too. He asks her if every human he loves will eventually leave him, and she replies that it's unfortunately so. Dissatisfied with his predicament, Andrew recruits Rupert for a new upgrade. He downloads every medical textbook into his memory and studies them to create the prototype for another upgrade. This time, however, the upgrade will be internal, giving him the same biological parts that humans have, like a heart and a nervous system. Rupert's astounded by the work, as it could prove revolutionary for the medical field. Now, as Andrew works on his upgrade, he continues meeting with Portia and the two become close friends. One day, on a walk in a park, Portia tells Andrew that she can't invest her emotions in a machine. And one day soon after, Andrew excitedly tells her that he's installed a nervous system into his body and now can process emotions. To test it, they kiss. But afterwards, Portia confesses that she's getting married to her boyfriend, Charles. Andrew politely replies that he wishes them the best. But this response annoys Portia. She tells him that being human involves doing the wrong thing sometimes and being flawed. But he can't seem to grasp that, as being perfect is built into his circuits. So later on, Andrew, with Rupert following, crashes Portia's engagement party to make snide remarks about Charles's abnormally long chin. Rupert tells Andrew that he's just jealous. And Andrew realizes that it's true, which must mean he's in love. Two weeks before the wedding, Andrew heads out to see Portia while she's making wedding preparations in the same church that Amanda got married in. Sure that Charles isn't right for Portia, Andrew tries to get her to admit that she loves him. Despite her better judgment, they kiss and afterwards end up in bed together. In the morning, they have breakfast together, as Andrew's new upgrade has made him so that he can eat and drink just like humans can. Portia tells him that she loves him and will be with him, but they're probably not going to be accepted by society. Upset by this revelation, Andrew makes a case in court. He wants a bill to be passed that declares him a human being. After all, he's now been upgraded with all the necessary internal structures, so for all intents and purposes, he's pretty much human. However, the judge vetoes that bill, stating that Andrew is immortal, which makes it impossible to classify him as human. Now, many years pass. Porsche is now 75 years old, while Andrew hasn't aged a day. Now, the technology that Rupert and Andrew came up together with made it possible to extend her life indefinitely, but Portia doesn't necessarily want that. She explains to Andrew that dying is natural and human, 
But while Andrew does understand that, he can't imagine a life without her. By now, Rupert Burns Enterprise is a huge company, and Mr. Burns himself is a very old man who now walks with the help of a cane. Andrew's on the operation table, ready for his final upgrade. If all goes well, the procedure will eliminate his immortality, slowly decaying Andrew's body over the course of 30 or so years. More years pass. Andrew ends up at court again. This time, however, he's aged. His hair's all white, his face droops with wrinkles. He tells the judge that he's no longer immortal and therefore would like his humanity to be acknowledged so that he can die with dignity. The judge admits that it's a controversial issue. That would probably take a lot of time to process, time that Andrew no longer has. He turns to Portia telling her at least he tried. In their final hours, Andrew and Portia lay side by side. Just before he dies, a hologram of the judge appears, approving his claim as human and acknowledging his marriage to Portia. He dies just before he sees it. In response to her husband's death, Portia calmly asks the nurse in charge, who turns out to be Galatea, to have her machine turned off so she can die beside him. Portia's eyes closed, and the screen fades to black. Ah, oh, gets me every time. Bicentennial Man, produced by Touchstone Pictures and stars Robin Williams, Embeth Davids, and Sam Neill. So given the choice, what would you do? Become a human like Andrew or stay a robot forever like Galatea? Go ahead and let us know in those comments below with that hashtag cinema recap. Thanks for watching. Till next time.